Hello, my name is Tom Wolliver. I'm the graduate coordinator of the Department of Nutritional Sciences and I'm responsible for the academic affairs. And seated next to me is Dr. Anthony Hanley, who is a graduate coordinator of Nutritional Sciences responsible for uh, the admissions and awards. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the department and I will be uh, giving you a little overview myself and describe our program. Dr. Hanley will talk about admissions and scholarships and then we have a couple of graduate students who will talk about the graduate student uh, perspective and after that we'll be glad to answer questions. So we'll be, the mission of our department is to improve health through research, teaching, and leadership in human nutrition, including basic nutritional sciences, clinical, sociocultural, and community aspects of nutrition. And we have, therefore, these three pillars uh, as part of our, our uh, program, uh, basic science, uh, community health and covering epidemiology, sociology, public health, and clinical studies, clinical medicine, and including, uh, we should probably add gastroenterology to the things that we have listed there. We have a very distinguished faculty. Uh, I won't go through all of the numbers on this slide, but I'd like to point out that we have uh, uh, several, three staff who have career awards, Canada Research Chairs, and two of our staff members have are been inducted into the Order of Canada, and we have two members of the uh, Fellows of the Royal uh, Society of Canada. So we have a distinguished, rather small, but distinguished faculty. Uh, the research interests of people span a wide range. We have people interested in cancer biology shown here, maternal nutrition and development, Dr. O'Connor, Young and Kim, Dr. Anderson, uh, an active group studying the brain, brain biochemistry with Dr. Bazinet and clinical aspects of uh, um, brain metabolism with Dr. Greenwood. Um, a number of us are interested in gut microbiota and we collaborate with others around uh, the university and other parts, other universities as well. Nutritional epidemiology, Dr. Hanley here and Dr. Boucher are interested in primarily in, in diabetes and Aboriginal communities and in the ways we can validate and accurately assess uh, nutritional intake in, in uh, these kinds of studies. We have an active group in international community population research. Some of our students travel to other parts of the world uh, to study nutrient requirements and how we can help undernourished uh, children and adults uh, become better nourished. Uh, community nutrition, Dr. Tarasek uh, is interested in food insecurity and poverty. We also have interests in uh, analyzing databases in relationship to nutrient bioavailability, in relationship to regulations. For example, how can we uh, promote the reduction of sodium in the, in the population? and so nutrition policy as well, Dr. O'Connor with folate form fortification, and a number of our faculty were on the DRI committee setting the recommendations for nutrient intakes. Um, most of our personnel, many of our personnel are in, at the university, uh, and these are the major interests of those at the department, childhood health and disease, chronic disease, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. We have faculty around the city in various hospitals, and other institutions around is shown here. I won't go through the listing of each of the individual faculty members. Their specific interests are shown on these slides, and you can uh, go back and look at these at your leisure because it would take, we don't have enough time for that. Uh, these pictures just show some of the laboratory facilities we have. Uh, we're in an older building, but there have been renovated, and the lab facilities are generally quite good. Uh, this shows uh, some of the student work areas that we have. Our students are spread around, not only in the department, but in various locations around the city. And we bring them together every week with the department seminar and other activities. We have uh, facilities for preparing food, storing it, uh, doing uh, food intake studies. And this particular picture shows us a, a child uh, looking at the effect of viewing television on food intake and uh, uh, feeding rooms and so on shown here. And also various facilities for studying exercise, food intake, taking blood samples and so on. So I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Hanley uh, who will talk about our graduate programs. 
Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Bolivar. Uh, and so just uh, as an aside to the to our audience, in a short time we're going to have uh, an opportunity for questions that you can uh, send to us over the webinar, uh, and we'll answer those, uh, following which we'll have a little interaction with some of uh, the members of our graduate student community who, who will tell you what life is like as a grad student in our, in our department. So we have uh, a small but vibrant and active uh, uh, graduate student community uh, in our department. You can see from this slide that uh, the denominator is small, so the numbers have varied somewhat over time, but we have anywhere from 60 to 80 graduate students at any one time. There's been a slight increasing trend, as you can see, in the number of PhD students uh, 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 over time. Um, but this kind of gives you a sense of, of what our numbers are for MSc and PhD students in our department. Uh, you got a sense from that previous slide that we have two research intensive, research focused uh, graduate training programs in nutritional sciences. The, the first shown here is the Master of Science or MSc in Nutritional Sciences. This is a two year degree. Um, the requirements uh, include two half courses as well as attendance at a weekly seminar. Uh, and as part of that commitment, each student during their MSc will make two seminars our presentations to the department, which uh, the audience includes faculty members and other graduate students. And then really the main part of the MSc is an independent research project and thesis, uh, and uh, uh, followed by a thesis defense at the end of the program. Um, uh, this is the final stage in which the student stands up and defends the work um, uh, prior to graduation. Uh, I will say at this point, uh, and, and you'll get a sense um, a number of times during this presentation, and Dr. Wolliver has already alluded to this, that uh, we have a high level of research excellence in our department. Uh, the projects that the students are involved in are frontline, uh, independently funded, competitively funded projects that uh, uh, very frequently result in first author publications for the students. And so this is uh, uh, to, to emphasize again research intensive training. We're, we're, we're not very course heavy. We're really interested in training students in the research experience and the research that you will do is, is on the cutting edge, uh, uh, externally funded and, and uh, invariably resulting in high impact publications. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the stipend. Um, this is a really something to, to keep in mind um, as you're thinking about whether to come to graduate school, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later in my presentation. The PhD in Nutritional Sciences is a four-year degree. Uh, the requirements include four half courses. Again, a week, the attendance at the weekly departmental seminar, and, and as a PhD student, you would do four of these, one per year. We have a qualifying exam, which really involves the formal uh, presentation and defense of the protocol that will constitute your, your PhD project. Um, again, the main thrust, the main activity, the thing that you'll throw most of your energy into will be your thesis uh, project, which will be a frontline, independent um, uh, research endeavor. Uh, the expectation is that you'll put this project up on your shoulders and carry it for the, the next four years, um, really developing your skills as an independent researcher as, as, you, as you move forward. Uh, the thesis defense is, is a two-stage uh, uh, a scenario in which we have a departmental defense uh, to really prepare students for the final uh, Senate oral examination, uh, which is really the final stage, the final step in the road to um, your PhD. Uh, as I say, we're going to talk about the stipend in a second. Um, at this stage, we really want to um, emphasize the fact that the the experience of graduate students in our department uh, is positive. These are um, some graphs from evaluations that the students do uh, at the end of courses. And we consistently, as you can see from some of these slides, from some of these graphs, we rate uh, uh, quite high relative to the U of T as a whole in terms of student satisfaction and other metrics that really speak to the quality of the graduate student experience. And you can get a little bit more of an organic and granular sense of that when our graduate students, um, Joseph and Vivian, speak a little bit later in our presentation. 
So how do you get in? Well, uh, right now we're going to talk a little bit about the admissions process and then we'll touch on some scholarships. So by now it should be uh, clear um, to you or you should be forming an opinion in your own mind whether graduate school is right for you. And I think if you're, if you're joining us on this webinar, you're, you're um, exploring that issue on a deeper level. And let me try to sell you on, on, on some of the high points of that. Uh, after undergrad, many students will go into the workforce, and there are some uh, benefits and perks associated with that, including a salary and, and uh, not having to be under the grindstone of academia any longer. But let me flip that over and tell you about why grad school might be the thing for you. As has been clear during Dr. Wolliver's presentation, this is a, a, a department that has a high level of international recognition for its research rigor and contributions. We have some of the global, truly the global leaders in nutritional science research in this department. And so you would be working very closely with people who are making major contributions to the scientific knowledge base in nutrition as it relates to health. So this speaks to innovation, this speaks to an interest in discovery, and you would be doing real projects on the front line of research if you're involved in our graduate programs. We have state-of-the-art technologies and methods, and as I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of our students, both at the MSc and particularly the PhD level, publish first author publications in high-impact journals. Uh, we have a, a variety of, of of experiences for students that graduate from our programs. Some of our students go on to academic positions, to positions in government, policy agencies, for example. There are a number of opportunities in the private sector, both in uh, research consulting, in the food industry, in the biotech industry. A number of our students go on to professional degrees in, in healthcare, uh, MD, DDS, physiotherapy, et cetera, and, and a number of, of, of different experiences that, that have occurred. The thing that's changed for graduate students in general from when Dr. Wolliver and I were graduate students is that there is now a guaranteed stipend. Now, you're not going to get rich as a graduate student. It's not a huge amount of money. But back in the day when I was a grad student, we had to work part time and, and compete uh, rigorously for external scholarships to fund our experience. As, a, as an accepted and enrolled graduate student in nutritional sciences and indeed in, in all of the basic science faculty of medicine departments, you were guaranteed a stipend that covers your tuition and your living expenses. Um, we'll talk in a minute about where that money comes from, but, but that is a reassurance that, that there is some minimal financial support for you to be involved in full-time studies as a graduate student. We're going to hear from Joseph and Vivian shortly. What's involved in the application process? Well, uh, the entire process is online, and so please, we're going to show you the website uh, at the end of our presentation, but please visit our website where it's all laid out very, very clearly. The uh, first deadline to keep in mind is January 15th of 2016, which is the deadline for the online application. There's a secondary date associated with this, uh, February the 1st, where all of your supporting documentation has to be wrapped up and submitted uh, for your application to be complete. We have other deadlines throughout the year, as you can see listed at the bottom of that slide, but we really encourage those of you that are, are serious about pursuing graduate school to get your materials in for this initial set of deadlines. What do you need for your application? Well, um, uh, fairly standard stuff that many of you would be familiar with at this stage. We need to see transcripts. If you're a U of T student, you can download those from Rosie. That's uh, a kind of an inside thing for U of T people. That's the uh, online repository of student information. Um, for people outside the U of T, we can deal initially with unofficial transcripts, but, but should you be admitted to our program or deemed admissible, we will ask you at that stage for a official transcripts. We need letters of reference, and, and there's some important nuances here that you should keep in mind. Because 
As we've stated a number of times now, this is a research-intensive program. It's very important for those letters to speak to your academic and research experience and potential. You may have worked in, in many different settings as, as, as you grew up through high school and through university. I certainly uh, had a variety of jobs uh, as a young person. But the, if you can put yourself in the position of the admissions committee, we're interested in hearing about your academic potential and research potential. So please make sure those letters come from professors or people that have worked with you or observed your, uh, supervised you in a research setting. We require institutional emails as well, uh, the letters to be submitted using institutional email addresses. Request those letters early. People are busy, and, and often they lose track of these things, so don't hesitate to harass and remind people if they have agreed to write you a letter. We need a statement of intent or a research proposal. And so if you're not currently working in a research capacity, you can write that as a, a document that touches on your research interests, what some of your experiences might be, and where you might want to go with your career. If you are currently working in, in an undergraduate capacity in a research setting, you can consider writing that statement of intent as a research proposal, particularly if you have a supervisor lined up already or who you've worked with. We also want a CV, um, and, and I guess keep in mind, again, with any CV, you want to keep in mind your audience. And so if you have any research experience, particularly if you've, if you've had any outputs, if your name is on an abstract or a paper, make sure that that is l documented and shown loud and clear on your CV. Use proper scientific citation style. Make sure your name is bolded or underlined so we can really see as, admission, as an admissions committee that you have been on the front lines of research and you've actually, uh, you've had some currency uh, out of that experience. What happens to my application? Well, there are basically three hoops that your application has to jump through. The first stop for your application is the School of Graduate Studies, and, and they have a look to make sure that you indeed have a four-year undergraduate degree and that your overall average is in the mid-B range. The uh, application then comes to uh, our departmental admissions committee. We have a slightly higher cut point. We're looking for an A-minus average over the final two years of full-time study. We like to see that you have some nutrition background in your undergraduate courses, and there's a variety of, of, of um, reasons for that. Most importantly, remember that you're going to be doing an intensive research project in nutrition. So some background in nutrition and related biological sciences is very, very important. And then if you've had some research experience, that is, is, is also a bonus. If you don't, don't worry. It's not a deal breaker at this stage. But if you do, that'll be very important to highlight. And then the final stage of, of the admissions process is a formal acceptance and arrangement by, by a supervisor in our department. And there are two main reasons for that. Uh, Dr. Wolliver alluded to the incredible range of inquiry in our department. We've got people doing classic wet lab benchtop basic science to people who work um, at the extreme end of that spectrum in the policy arena. And so we want to make sure that your interests and your backgrounds as a student align with what the supervisor is going to be doing. The other part of this is based on money. And, and because of the guaranteed stipend, uh, though those monies largely today come from the supervisor's operating grants or other financial resources at hand. And given the uh, constraints on funding these days, uh, typically, P, uh, supervisors can only take on a, a number of students at any one time given budgetary constraints. So those are the three steps. Other issues, if you don't immediately match up with the supervisor, if you're deemed acceptable to the department but you don't immediately match up with the supervisor, you can defer for up to one year. We ask that students contact potential supervisors after that second stage admission letter is put forward. And you can see our numbers for acceptance to the program and eventual linking to supervisors in the third point on that slide. Scholarships, just quickly, because we want to leave some time for questions. Why, what would be the point of applying for a scholarship? Well, there are three good reasons. There's actually four, and, and I'll, I'll, uh, the fourth one isn't on the slide, but I'll tell you about that one as well. 
applying for scholarships, it's, it's like applying for a grant. And if you're going to go forward in your life as a researcher or a scientist, this is going to be something you're doing almost every day in some respect. It's part of the life cycle of a scientist. And so it's good to get used to it now. Get practice, get a sense of what the different requirements are for these scholarships and applications. The more you do it, the more you, 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 you improve at the skill set that's required for writing grants and personnel awards. The, the bits that, you, that go into these applications are actually parts uh, um, that get um, recycled and expanded and grow into other documents that you use as part of your academic career. So for example, the one-page proposal that is, is often part of these applications becomes the seed or the stem cell that grows into the five-pager that you show at your first committee meeting and that grows into the next larger document. So these aren't one-offs. These, these are things that become part of your toolkit going forward. It's also really good on your CV if you get an external um, competitive, peer-reviewed award. It shows that you're in the you're on the A list of students uh, in terms of, of of excellence and competitiveness for external awards. The third point on this slide is it's good for your supervisor, and I kind of explained earlier where the money from the stipend comes from. So if you can bring in resources into your lab, it helps overall the bottom line of your lab in terms of operations, other students, etc. The fourth point here that isn't on the slide um, but is also important to keep in mind is that it's kind of an administrative requirement in that to apply for some awards, you have to have shown that you're applying broadly to um, to, uh, inter to national competitive agencies, and we'll touch on some of those later. I won't go through this slide because many of the requirements are very similar to what we talked about for admissions, transcripts, letters of reference, a, a protocol or a letter of intent, a CV, and then some other sections about environment, career plans, et cetera. Uh, these slides are being recorded so you can study those. And really, you do need to look at each of the agency requirements very carefully because there are some subtle differences that, that need to be observed. Um, You've got to observe deadlines. There, the, the, there's absolutely no wiggle room. The deadlines are deadlines, and if you're even one day late, um, it's it's next to impossible to to get your application in. So please observe those deadlines. Start early. Request your transcripts and your letters of reference as early as possible. Um, our department is uh, funded through both CIHR and NSERC. These are two of the three tri-council federal agencies that fund science in this country. Um, when you're applying, you might want to, th th it's important to think about which of those agencies is a better fit for you in terms of your interest and background. Um, now, some administrative uh, details here to keep in mind. If you're from outside the U of T and you're submitting an application to, say, CHR or NSERC, this happens now um, in, a, in a unified fashion through the NSERC website. So even if you're applying for CHR, it's got to go through the NSERC website. And you have to indicate our department as your selected program on those administrative forms. For the OGS, the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, again, submitted through the University of Toronto School of Graduate Studies website. And again, you need to indicate the Department of Nutritional Sciences as your target um, department, the place that you want to come and study. I've got a contact email down there. Louisa Kung is our graduate um, administrator, and she's very knowledgeable and very hel helpful in, in, in these matters. How does the review work? Uh, it, I, again, I'm not going to go into an enormous amount of detail here because it's a little bit dry, but increasingly there's been downloading of responsibilities to universities and departments, and typically we're issued quotas as a t department um, in terms of the number of applications we can either award or put forward to the next level of competition at the School of Graduate Studies, uh, and those details are, are laid out here. Final points. Um, in, in, in both applications for our department admission as well as scholarships. Remember your audience. Typically, these uh, applications and grants are being reviewed by tired, overworked uh, faculty members who are looking at a stack, dozens and dozens of applications. And so clarity and conciseness and completeness is critical. You want to emphasize the best parts of your application and your background. So if you've got a paper or an abstract, Make sure that's emphasized and loud and clear on your application. Typos and sloppiness are going to be irritants. 
The good news is that from our department's perspective, our success rates are high. And in this graph I'm showing you for MSc students, our uh, percentage of students who hold external scholarships, you can see we're uh, above the uh, faculty and, and life sciences average, uh, and that's also the case for our PhD students. And so our students do well when they apply for these scholarships. I'm going to stop there, and I think in a moment we'll hear from, from, um, from Vivian uh, and Joseph about the graduate student perspective, but now perhaps we can take some questions about the graduate program, um, the, any questions about admissions, um, before we turn it over to, to the grad students to give their perspective. Nothing has come in on, uh, okay, so maybe what we could do then is, is have Vivian and Joseph come up and, and if, if, if some questions come up later, we'll happily uh, chime in uh, and, and answer those questions. So hi everyone, my name is Vivian and I'm a second year master's student in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Um, sorry, do I, no, oh, there we go. So I actually am located at St. Michael's Hospital. I'm not located right on campus and I'm working with Dr. Stephen Piper and Dr. Jenkins at the Risk Factor Modification Center. This is a picture of our group, we're quite large. <laughs> And so a typical day in the life for me, um, so I do a lot of dry lab work, mostly dealing with data analysis, manuscript writing, um, collaborating with my colleagues. So we tend to work at the computer for most of the day or have discussions at um, roundtable meetings. And this is actually a picture of one of our group meeting rooms. So this is where we might um, perhaps uh, practice for our thesis defenses or hold our committee meetings. And one of my favorite parts of being a grad student is having the opportunity to attend uh, several conferences, so national and international. And these have provided us with the opportunity not only to, I guess, learn from leaders and experts in the field, but also share our own research um, to the wider scientific community. And also some other extracurriculars that I have been able to get involved with are the Nutritional Sciences Graduate Student Association. So we'll go um, into more detail about that after. And also the Canadian Nutrition Society, so a more national level organization. And these are also another really good chance to be able to stay involved um, also being able to kind of take what we've learned in the classroom and in the lab and I guess apply it um, in real life in a meaningful manner. And also we have weekly seminars every Thursday. These are a chance for us to be able to share our own research within our department. Um, we also have various teaching assistant opportunities. So we have courses ranging from 25 hours to 50 hours. And uh, contrary to popular belief, we do have time for ourselves and um, time for fun outside of the lab. So for that me, or sorry, for me, that means being able to teach yoga. And um, so yeah, there is lots of chance to have that work-life balance. And with that, I'll pass it on to Joseph. Thanks, Vivian. So uh, hi, everybody. My name is Joseph, uh, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Um, I did my undergraduate degree here at the University of Toronto. Um, I did a specialist in biology and also a major in nutritional sciences. Uh, I really got involved in research in my third and fourth year when I took uh, some independent research courses, and I was able to do projects uh, working alongside graduate students and faculty in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Um, so that really spurred my interest in grad school. Uh, and in uh, May of 2013, uh, I was admitted into the MSc program here. Um, and then what I did was within one year, you're allowed to reclassify into the PhD program if your uh, project sort of allows for that and that suits your uh, career and interests and goals. Um, so I reclassified uh, last summer. I uh, was admitted into the PhD program. Uh, so with that, you don't get an MSc, but you do um, sort of get that year counted towards your, your PhD time. Um, so and my current area of research uh, during my project is uh, nutrigenomics. So what we really do is look at uh, gene interactions uh, for a number of various uh, nutritional sciences outcomes and nutrient exposures. 
So I'll just take you through a sort of a more or less typical day in the life of a student in our lab, at least. Uh, our lab is interesting because we kind of focus on both dry lab materials as well as wet lab activities. M more so dry, but there are a number of things that we will actually have to do sort of on the uh, on the bench tops and the basic si science side of things. So I'll start with the dry lab day. Um, it might start uh, early in the morning at 9 a.m., more or less, not too early. Um, sort of responding to emails, doing some uh, inbox cleanup. Um, for about an hour, and then after that, I might get into some data analysis. So in our lab, we do a lot of uh, epidemiological analysis, so we'll, we'll be looking at uh, relatively large databases and more or less crunching some numbers on the computer. Um, after that, I might take uh, a 30-minute lunch, and naturally, being a nutritional scientist student, it'll always be a very healthy lunch. Uh, that might be a little bit of a stretch sometimes, but we'll go with it. Um, from 12.30 to 1, you might have uh, a meeting with a supervisor or a committee, me uh, committee member uh, where you discuss your research or other aspects of your work. Um, from 1 to 3, a couple hours during the day, you might attend a class. Uh, now, as Dr. Hanley uh, alluded to, classes aren't really the focus of the degree. There'll be a little bit of coursework, but it won't be every day. It might be one day a week uh, or maybe two in some cases, uh, but for the most part, the majority of the work will be thesis-based. Uh, and then my day might wrap up with a little bit more data analysis and possibly a manuscript or abstract writing. So now I can go through um, sort of the flip, flip side of that and talk about a wet lab day. Um, so that uh, this is just a general guideline. It doesn't always break down exactly like this, but for the purposes of this talk, um, we can say it starts at about 9 in the morning where you'll be doing some prep, uh, possibly taking some freezer inventory or f determining where your samples are going to be found. Um, from 9.30 to about 1, you might be doing some work at the bench, depending on what sort of experiment you're running. Um, still have time for a lunch, grab a quick lunch while samples are thawing or, or tests are running, and then you can get back to it and for another few hours, um, finish up at around 4.30 with some lab work, uh, and then uh, take care of the cleanup and sort of any procedures you need to uh, take care of before the day is done, and you can sort of wrap that up uh, with five, at 5 o'clock, sometimes possibly later, but this is just a general uh, breakdown of a day in the life of a student doing wet lab research in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Uh, so now we're going to take a minute to talk about the um, Graduate Student Association in our department, um, the Nutritional Sciences Graduate Student Association, NSGSA. Uh, I'm actually the president of this association this year. Vivian is our uh, vice president. So we're going to talk about a few of the opportunities available to students through uh, our Graduate Student Association. I think Vivian's going to talk a little bit about some of the outreach initiatives. All right. Thanks, Joseph. So we do organize a lot of outreach opportunities for the students in the department. And uh, for example, some of the pictures here um, show our events. Oh, is this our social events? All right, there we go. <laughs> so we have um, bake sales usually once a month, and we try to raise money so that we can um, create a healthy dinner for the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, we also have events where we organize educational seminars around nutrition. Um, we've uh, participated in the Royal Agricultural Fair, so organizing nutrition-related activities for children who attend that. Um, we also have several social events. So Joseph and I actually just came from our Halloween potluck. Um, and this is a picture from last year's party. In addition to that, we have um, a big Christmas dinner. We have had pizza, board games night, so a lot of really great opportunities to kind of meet people in the department and just take a little break from our lab work. And we have a few other uh, important extracurriculars worth mentioning. Um, for those of you who are uh, athletically inclined and enjoy sports, we have a couple options. Uh, a really popular team in our um, student association is the Neutralizers Volleyball Team. Uh, we play year-round um, in, in the gym during the uh, during the school year as part of the Graduate Students Union um, sort of league. And then we also uh, started recently playing in the summer, uh, get some beach volleyball in there. So that's been great to sort of keep morale high in the department, and it's a really fun experience for everyone who joins. Uh, we also do um, some yoga sessions for students to uh, who are flexible and enjoy that, and it helps uh, relieve stress. Uh, and it's always good to get out and just uh, take a step back once in a while and enjoy that. Um, and also a program that um, is very helpful for first-year master's students particularly is the DNS Buddies program. Um, and what that involves is basically it's a partnership between a first-year master's student uh, and an upper-year, likely PhD student in the department where they can sort of learn and interact uh, from the upper year student uh, in sort of a mentor mentee setting. Uh, and that's definitely something that a lot of incoming students uh, find very valuable. 
So I think that uh, concludes the formal presentation uh, part of our of our show. Um, what we'll do now, I think, is open it up to questions to either Vivian and myself, uh, as well as Dr. Uh, Hanley and Walliver. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to take them as they come in. Right. Oh, okay. So there was there was one question here, um, uh, an admission specific question. So maybe I'll handle that. Uh, the question is uh, regarding um, uh, really start times and admission deadlines for a student. This is this is Marie Louise um, who's submitted this question, and she's asking. Uh, she's taking courses in the summer. Her official graduation is in October 2016, but she'll finish all her courses in July. And so, um, what what the implications of that are that unfortunately you'll miss the summer deadline for applications, but we do have a fall intake, which is not listed on the slide, but if you go to our website, you can see it listed there, and we have the option for students to start their program in January. So the, the majority of students do uh, uh, start in September, but we do have a subset every year that start in January uh, for reasons such as this. And so uh, you can contact us by email if you want to, to discuss some of the finer details of, of, of that. Um, uh, often we, we, we are asked how much nutrition is needed to apply to our department. How many nutrition courses, uh, if, if, you know, if my degree wasn't in, if my major or my specialist wasn't in nutrition or nutritional sciences, am I still eligible to apply? So the way that this typically plays out is, is as follows. We do like to see at least one or two nutrition courses on a background of other relevant biological sciences. And, and, and again, the reason for this is that students are very quickly uh, immersed in a fast-paced research-intensive environment. And so you don't want to be playing catch-up in terms of your fundamental knowledge of nutrition uh, or food science or food technology. Uh, while you're you're expected to to put a um, uh, externally funded research project up on your back and run with it and deliver it in the context of a few short years, and so people who are coming from from highly divergent backgrounds, and so if for example, and this is not to denigrate any other disciplines, I'm using it solely as an example. If you've done a degree in English or in economics or or, or in um, uh, even a branch of science that is quite distant from nutrition and human biology, uh, then then it, it would make it very difficult for you to be admitted to our program because of the lack of nutrition courses. Again, it doesn't have to be, uh, all 20 courses don't have to be in nutrition, but we like to see uh, uh, one or hopefully a few on a background of biology, physiology, biochemistry, something like that. Because, because again, you're going to be uh, uh, thrown in feet first into uh, a project that, that re really will require you to have that, that knowledge right away. Some of our projects could be related to psychology or, right. or exercise science. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, there can be a broad, a broad range of disciplines coming that you've come from. And but that, some science background is is certainly important. And and then Dr. Wolver makes an excellent point in that we have a, a growing areas of sports nutrition as well as uh, neuro, nutritional neuroscience. And so so we've had some recent students who've come in with strong backgrounds in those areas who who have fit in to specific programs wonderfully. Um, and again, if if you have specific questions about that, please please. Uh, please let us know by email on our, our department website. Okay. Um, another question that we typically receive is, will I be, after my program, my graduate program, will I be a registered dietitian? And so the answer is no. Um, the, the background and training required to um, to become a, uh, a registered dietitian is very, very different. And, and so if, if that is your, your interest and your goal, uh, I would encourage you to visit the Dietitians of Canada website 
uh, where you can learn about the requirements um, in, in terms of background coursework and then applying for internships. Uh, that's very different from what we do in, in research. Well, having said that, though, we, we get a lot of dietitians coming in to do MSc programs, and the MSc program is recognized by the Dietitians of Canada, and, and they, can, they get some professional um, advancement for that degree. Right. And that, that's after they've, they've, after done, they've, they've, done, after their they've done their internship. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're not getting a tsunami of questions. Um, uh, so Either very clear or very unclear, I suppose. Yes, yeah. So maybe, Joseph and Vivian, can you remember back uh, to some, some things that you have, have uh, encountered in your own experience? Yeah. Uh, maybe you speak a little bit to ways of finding a supervisor or, or that if, if you're not sort of sure, because I know that's sort of an area where students have a lot of questions when they're entering the department. I'll hand that over to Dr. Wolver. Um, I think. There are several approaches. If you're an undergraduate at the University of Toronto, there's a little bit of an advantage because you can do an undergraduate research course in our department, and that, that then you've introduced to supervisors, and, and, and uh, if you're doing well, then they may want to continue uh, being associated with you. If you're from outside, it's really based on contacting supervisors, or, yeah, I think that's it. And usually, when is it in about... March, April, they get a, you'll get a letter, yeah. uh, receive a letter indicating whether you're admissible, whether you're, uh, you're, you're allowed to be admitted, if you like. And that's the, the time all of this, the supervisors in the department get circulated with a list of students who are kind of ranked based on their, their application quality. And um, uh, that's the time when you can start contacting supervisors uh, and asking about whether they are able to take students. Uh, a number of the people you've seen on that list may not be able to take students. Uh, they may be coming up for retirement or so on, or they may not have funding enough to be able to take students. But it's more or less up to the students, I think, to, to contact supervisors. Okay. So we uh, are going to wrap this up. Thank you very much. Oh, there is one quick question. There's a question from Edward. What can I expect with a Master's of Science, job-wise? So good question. The, 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 what are the job prospects after an MSc in Nutritional Sciences? And, and really, uh, uh, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, we have had quite a variety of, of experiences um, from the uh, standard linear experience of going on and doing a PhD and continuing on in an academic sort of a setting. Uh, people have entered directly into the workforce uh, with an MSc uh, in, in terms of the um, the food industry, uh, scientific consulting, uh, people have gone to jobs in government. Uh, uh, there is the opportunity to become a research uh, worker. Some, some people, fields. some people go in and op do their own thing. They have, for example, they start up a nutrition exercise program, or they become consultants in that area if they're on private company or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, an MSc is really a much more flexible degree in terms of what your prospects are. If you've done a PhD, you've closed the door to a number of areas, but an MSc is, is, is a very nice degree because you can determine whether really the research life is for you and how well you're doing and whether you enjoy it and whether you want to go on. And if you do have an MSc, it doesn't really prevent you from doing anything else you might wish to do. And in many cases, it will be seen as a useful degree, which is going to give you an advantage when you're looking for a job. Hmm. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks very much for um, for uh, spending a bit of time with us today. If if some questions come up uh, afterwards, uh, please contact us. Um, uh, the uh, 
email address and website uh, are uh, listed, uh, just, just the website, but you can find relevant emails here uh, uh, on this website if you have any questions about admissions or scholarships or experience in the program. Uh, and again, the webinar has been recorded and the slides uh, will be accessible. So uh, again, thanks for your time and we hope to uh, see some of you uh, in uh, September.